1982, seven people died after taking extra-strength Tylenol that had been purchased in the Chicago area. After a lengthy investigation turned up almost no leads, the crime has never been solved. This is Monsters Mysteries. On the morning of September 29, 1982, 12-year-old Mary Kellerman woke up with a sore throat and a runny nose. She had just started the 7th grade at Adams Junior High in Schaumburg, Illinois, about an hour northwest of Chicago. She told her parents, Dennis and Gina Kellerman, about her symptoms and they gave her a single extra-strength Tylenol pill to help ease her symptoms and told her that she didn't have to go to school that day. At about 7 o'clock in the morning, Mary was found unconscious on the bathroom floor. Dennis Kellerman said, quote, I heard her go into the bathroom. I heard the door close. Then I heard something drop. I went to the bathroom door. I called, Mary, are you okay? There was no answer. I called again, Mary, are you okay? There was still no answer, so I opened up the bathroom door and my little girl was on the floor unconscious. She was still in her pajamas, end quote. Paramedics arrived on the scene and did everything they could to revive the young girl, but not long after they got to Alexian Brothers Medical Center, Mary was pronounced dead. The doctors didn't know why Mary died so suddenly and theorized that she might have had a stroke. The parents had told them that Mary wasn't on any medications besides the Tylenol she had taken that morning. Millions of people take Tylenol every day, so that wasn't a concern. Mary's body was taken to the medical examiner's office as a precaution due to her age. The same day, 27-year-old Adam Janis had taken a sick day from his job with the United States Postal Service. He went to pick up his kids from preschool in the late morning and stopped at the store to pick up some painkillers. When he got home at around noon, he said he was going to take some Tylenol and lay down. Just minutes later, he stumbled into the kitchen and collapsed. Thomas Kim, the medical director of Northwest Community Hospital's intensive care unit, said that they just couldn't get him resuscitated when he came into their unit. Once Adam was pronounced dead, they marked it down as a possible heart attack. After Dr. Kim explained to Adam's family what had happened, they all went back to the Janus home to mourn their loss. At about 5 p.m., Adam's younger brother, Stanley, who suffered from chronic back pain, asked his wife, Teresa, to get him some Tylenol. Teresa found the bottom that Adam had just purchased and gave two capsules to Stanley before taking to herself. The couple both collapsed. Dr. Kim was getting ready to leave the hospital when he was told that other members of the Janus family were coming into the emergency room. The doctor took his coat off and went back to work, trying to resuscitate both Stanley and Teresa. Stanley died a few hours later, and Teresa remained in critical condition on life support. Earlier that day, 27-year-old Mary Lynn Reiner was not feeling well, so she took some Tylenol at about 3.45 in the afternoon. She had previously given birth to her fourth child a week earlier. She stayed at home taking care of the kids while her husband, Ed Reiner, worked. He had just come in the door when he saw Lynn lying down on the floor. Paramedics arrived and rushed her to the hospital where she was listed in critical condition. Staff at Northwest Community Hospital started seriously questioning what was going on with the cases in the Janus family. Even though they hadn't connected the other two cases to these three, it was definitely strange to have one man die, and then have two more otherwise healthy adults come into the hospital after being at the first person's house. At the same time, 31-year-old Mary McFarland was working at an Illinois Bell store, a place where they sold nothing but landline telephones. I know, right? At about 6.30 p.m., she told her co-workers that she had a headache and went in the back room to take some Tylenol. Within minutes, she fell to the floor. She was taken to Good Samaritan Hospital where she was listed in critical condition and placed on life support. It was assumed that she had ingested something bad. Nick Pichos, an investigator for the Cook County Medical Examiner's Office, was notified and began investigating the situation. Nick, along with Nurse Helen Jensen and police officers, went to the Janus home to look for contaminants that could have caused the family members to all get sick. Nick described going into the house with the idea that he would immediately identify the cause of the illness, but he found nothing. He looked in the basement where they did some metal work because sometimes cyanide is used in metal polishing, but there wasn't anything harmful down there. 
Helen found a bottle of Tylenol in the bathroom and counted six pills missing. Six pills, three victims. Helen was sure that it was the Tylenol. While Nick and Helen were headed back to the hospital with the bottle of Tylenol, 35-year-old flight attendant Paula Prince had just landed at the Chicago O'Hare airport and was on her way home. She stopped at the drugstore to pick up some Tylenol before heading back home. She took the Tylenol in the bathroom of her apartment and collapsed before she hit the bathroom doorway. Dr. Kim was beating himself up over not being able to figure out what was wrong with his patients. He knew that they matched cyanide poisoning, but couldn't figure out where they would have been exposed to it. At the time, the hospital didn't have the ability to test blood for cyanide, so he gathered blood samples from all of the victims and sent them to a special lab that could do the testing for him. Investigator Pichos had learned about Mary Kellerman's death earlier that day and that paramedics had inventoried a bottle of Tylenol when they were at the house that morning. Nick had a police officer go pick up the bottle from the house, and he noted that the lot numbers were the same on each bottle, MC-2880. He called the medical examiner and told him what he found. Medical examiner Edmund Donahue told Nick to open the bottles and smell them. He opened both bottles, and as he poured the contents out, he was overwhelmed with the strong smell of almonds. They had finally found the source of the cyanide poisoning. Cyanide is an asphyxiant. It blocks the red blood cells from receiving oxygen, so even if you're breathing in, no oxygen is being absorbed into your bloodstream. The finding was confirmed when Dr. Kim got the lab report at 1 a.m. the next morning. The blood samples had over 100 times more cyanide than was necessary to kill a human being. Later that morning, Mary McFarland was pronounced dead at 3.15 a.m., and then Mary Lynn Reiner was pronounced dead at 9.30 a.m. Reports were coming out alerting different hospitals that there could be a connection between their patients and Tylenol. At 10 a.m. on September 30, 1982, the Cook County Medical Examiner's Office held a press conference to tell people that they had found cyanide in Tylenol and that people should not take it for a while until they figure out what was going on. At this time, they had five deaths, Mary Kellerman, Adam Janis, Stanley Janis, Mary McFarland, and Mary Lynn Reiner, plus Teresa Janis, who was still on life support. At 3 p.m. that day, Johnson & Johnson, the manufacturer of Tylenol, announced a recall from all of the product from lot MC-2880. The realization that someone had intentionally laced Tylenol with cyanide with the express intent of harming people became very real. Authorities started getting together to investigate how the cyanide got into the Tylenol and how far the problem may have reached. They didn't know if this was an isolated incident or if it was happening countrywide. At 1.15 p.m. on October 1st, Teresa Janis was taken off life support and pronounced dead. Paula Prince was supposed to meet her sister to have dinner the previous evening, but didn't show up and wasn't answering her phone. That was already odd, but when she didn't arrive at the airport for her shift that day, family members called the police for a welfare check. Paula's body was discovered in her apartment at 5 o'clock that evening. When they saw the open bottle of Tylenol, they knew what the cause of death was going to be. With Paula Prince residing in the Chicago city limits, Mayor Jane Byrne held a press conference at 11 p.m. announcing the death of Miss Prince and informing the residents that all of the Tylenol would be removed from shelves in the Chicago area. It was one of the most significant announcements that the mayor had ever had to make. The deaths prompted a nationwide panic over tainted Tylenol. People were calling hospitals, poison control centers, and emergency services reporting that they or someone they loved had taken some Tylenol and wanted to know if they were going to die. Seattle's Poison Control Center informed its citizens that if they had indeed been poisoned with cyanide, they'd be dead before they even were able to reach the phone to make the call. On October 5th, Johnson & Johnson recalled all Tylenol products nationwide. It was 31 million bottles, valued at over $100 million. As bottles were being removed from the shelves, they were being tested for cyanide, and another contaminated bottle was found during the removal from a drugstore. An investigation of the manufacturing plant resulted in no evidence that the cyanide was being introduced at the factory. Authorities suspected that someone was taking bottles off of the shelf at the store, poisoning them, and then placing the bottles back on the store shelf. 
At the time, there were no safety seals on over-the-counter medications. You could just open the bottle, pull out the cotton, and you had access to the pills. During the investigation, tainted bottles of Tylenol were found right away at six stores in the Chicago area, Jewel Foods in Arlington Heights, Jewel Foods in Grove Village, Osco Drugstore in Schaumburg, Walgreens Drugstore in Chicago, Frank's Finer Foods in Winfield, and another undisclosed retail outlet. Each store had one affected bottle with three to ten poison pills inside except for Osco Drugstore. It had two affected bottles. A month later, more tests identified one more tainted bottle that had come from a store near where Paula Prince had purchased her Tylenol. Tests showed that the specific poison used was potassium cyanide, which is used in fertilizer production, film processing, steel plating, and the manufacturing of other chemicals. They brought in Roger Arnold, a 48-year-old amateur chemist who also worked as a dockhand at the warehouse that supplied Tylenol to two of the stores on the list. A search of his apartment turned up various weapons and two one-way tickets to Thailand, plus a book that described killing people by stuffing poison into capsules. Despite that, they were unable to find any solid evidence that he was now dubbed the Tylenol terrorist. He was arrested on illegal weapons charges and was released on $6,000 bond. On October 6th, Johnson & Johnson received a letter demanding $1 million in order to stop the poisoning of the Tylenol. The handwritten letter instructed Johnson & Johnson to respond via the Chicago Tribune, but they didn't. They gave the letter to police, who traced it to a man named James Lewis. Police were certain that James wasn't the killer. He was a con man who was already wanted in connection to the murder of an elderly man and a jewel robbery. After a few weeks of having the police and FBI looking for him, James sent another letter to Johnson & Johnson claiming that he had nothing to do with the Tylenol murders and he and his wife were unarmed. He signed it Robert Richardson, a known alias of James Lewis. James was arrested at the public library in New York City. The following week, his wife Leanne Lewis turned herself in. A handwriting sample from James matched the writing on the extortion letter and his fingerprint was found on the page, but there was no evidence connecting him to the actual killings. Registration records for a hotel in New York showed that they were not in the Chicago area at the time the bottles would have been tampered with. Evidence showed that Leanne had been at work in New York that day, and witnesses say James met her for lunch. James was convicted of extortion in six other counts of mail and credit card fraud, and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. He was released on parole in 1995 after serving 13 years. Following the arrest of James Lewis, no new leads surfaced and the case went cold. Tylenol reintroduced their product with new shrink-wrapped seals and tamper-resistant caps. In 1983, Congress approved the Tylenol bill that made the malicious tampering of consumer products a federal crime. In 1989, the FDA introduced national requirements for all over-the-counter medication to be tamper-resistant. So who filled those Tylenol capsules with cyanide? The most prominent theories are that either Roger Arnold or James Lewis actually did do it. Just because you can't find evidence that someone committed a crime doesn't mean they didn't commit the crime. Police investigated James Lewis even after he was sentenced for extortion and could only ever find evidence that made him less likely to be the killer. Roger Arnold, however, eventually shot and killed a man named John Stanisha. Roger was upset at a bar owner named Marty Sinclair because he thought he had turned him into police. Roger went to shoot Marty, but shot John instead in a case of mistaken identity. Roger Arnold was sentenced to life in prison and died in 2008. Now, police say they cleared him, but anyone who's willing to shoot and kill someone out of retaliation still seems suspect in my book. It's still possible he had something to do with the Tylenol killings. Some people think that the killer is someone who wanted one of the victims dead and just spread the poison out across other bottles to cover their tracks. I guess you'd have to look into the family members of the victims, which I don't know that the police did. I imagine if anyone had taken out a big life insurance policy on any one of the victims, it may have raised red flags. But I don't know how easy it would be to look into those things now. Another theory is that Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, was responsible for the murders. His parents had a house in the Chicago area at the time, and his first bombings took place around that area. 
after he was arrested. The FBI asked if they could take a DNA sample, and Ted said he would, if the U.S. Marshals stopped an auction they were having to sell off a bunch of his stuff. The U.S. Marshals said no, so Ted also said no, but he told the FBI that he never used cyanide. It may seem like a good fit at first, but Ted Gazinski left his bombs places where more specific people would find them. Specific departments and universities, airline companies, computer stores. I don't think he wanted to take his rage out on any random person with such a wide range as the Tylenol murders. A woman named Michelle Rosen believes that the poisonings originated from Johnson & Johnson. Michelle, who happens to be the daughter of Mary Lynn Reiner, one of the victims, connected with Scott Bartz, an ex-Johnson & Johnson employee turned whistleblower. The pair attempted to make a documentary movie about what really happened that led to the deaths of seven people in the Chicago area in 1982. Authorities claimed they found bottles that had been tampered with at seven different locations, yet the bottles all had the same lot number, MC2880. A little bit of a coincidence if someone was going into different stores and picking bottles off the shelf to tamper with. Having the bottles have the same lot number makes it much more likely that they were tampered with somewhere in the distribution cycle. You may remember that I said, quote, an investigation into the manufacturing plant resulted in no evidence that cyanide was being introduced at the factory, end quote. Well, that statement came after Johnson & Johnson inspected their facilities and they said the poison didn't come from their factory. I haven't been able to find any information that there was any official investigation into the factory or supply chain that resulted in any proof that cleared those as possible sources of the tampering. It's all Johnson & Johnson's word. Michelle was not able to raise the funding she needed to make the documentary, and the theory has been relatively brushed aside. This is one of those cases that leaves me with no strong opinion one way or the other. There was really not a lot to go on. I do think it's suspect that Johnson & Johnson basically cleared themselves, and I would be interested in hearing more about that. I'm naturally untrustworthy of large corporations. They choose profit over people far too regularly. Let me know what you think in the comments or discuss the case on our subreddit at r forward slash this is monsters. Thanks. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233 or go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. The great thing about this website is that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will instantly take your browser to a Google search page. In the event the abuser is nearby, you can assure that you don't get caught trying to get help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Be safe. Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. Also, remember that if you'd like to support the show, the easiest way is to donate a few bucks at Buy Me A Coffee or check out some of our merchandise at Teespring. You can find information on how to do that along with links to our social media at thisismonsters.com. Thanks again.